Well, it's so good to uh, be with you all here tonight. If you have your Bibles, you can read along with me. I'm going to read to you from God's Word. In the 20th chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 16, God has something to say to us. For the, this is Jesus teaching, by the way, and he's doing a lot of teaching in this section of the Gospel of Matthew. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day, and he sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing, and he told them, he said, well, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon did the same thing. At about five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one's hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. So the the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner these who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and, and, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I give you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. These are the words of Jesus. So I want you to walk with me through this parable. And a parable is really, uh, it's a simple story designed to teach us something very, very important, spiritual lessons. So what are we going to learn from this parable here tonight? And, and Jesus doesn't give us an interpretation of this story like he does with so many other parables. This particular parable speaks to those who feel superior. Remember, the parable is taught then in that context, but it's for us to apply now. So it speaks to those who feel superior because of Heritage, I come from a long line of Christians. Um, Favored position, I worked my way up into this hierarchy and I'm in management, so to speak. Uh, Length of time, I've been following you, Jesus, for a long, long time. Longer than these people. Level of tithing, Lord, I start giving at 10%. You wouldn't believe how much I give. Charitable acts in the community, mission trips taken, all of that. In the modern version Those are some of the ways we measure things. So the parable is really not about the laborers in the vineyards. In fact, this isn't even a story about the growth of the crop. Um, There's no significant significant attention paid to the activities of the workers. And all we hear is complaints of those who work all day long. And really, the story isn't about them either. Here's what it's about. Jesus' parable highlights the generosity of God and our tendency, this is hard, to pass judgment on others. I'd love to say that isn't true, but it is true. I know in my own life for certain. So one man stated it this way, one writer, he said, as the ultimate landowner, God will use what has always belonged to the creator for the good of all, even if humans fail to see the world through God's eyes. And the landowner's question in the parable is really the punchline for Jesus when he says, are you envious 
because I am generous? Well, you know what they felt? No fair. This is no fair. It's just wrong. And the thing that angered these early workers, it wasn't the landowner's greed. You know what it was? It was his grace. It wasn't greed. It was his grace. They were angry that while they worked long and hard all day long, put in all the most work, they received the same pay as those who worked for an hour and those who worked for an hour did a lot less. And they all received what was due according to the sovereign landowner's decision representing our father. He's sovereign and he decides. He dispenses his grace as he sees fit. You know what else we could say no fair to? We are forgiven our sin, those who have come to Christ and received him as our savior. We are forgiven our sin, yet we keep on sinning. That's not fair, is it? If we're gonna talk about what's fair and balanced, that's not fair. So God's grace isn't fair. It doesn't even work in the world of what's fair and what isn't. It's unearned favor. What do we really deserve? This is hard. Stay with me. What do we really deserve? What is actually fair? Judgment. Really? I mean, it's hard, but it's true. We deserve judgment, and we don't want it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want to be judged. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. But we do. We judge Plain and simple. I don't want judgment against me, but we judge. It's the irony of it all. And this is a tendency to decide the fate of others based on what I think their just treatment is. I get to decide. That's what judgment is. That's how it operates. So here's some examples. There's snap judgments. I just did one the other day. Pulled up to a stop sign, a four-way. I was clearly there eight feet before the person to my right. Clearly, I mean, it's so obvious. And they went right through. They paused. They didn't stop. They didn't even stop. They paused and went right through. And you know what my brain did? And you wouldn't want to be in here, but you know what my brain did? You know, they probably do this to everybody. I bet they do it at work. I bet people can't stand them. I bet in their neighborhood they're a pariah. And I bet they got a ton of tickets and they're probably drunk. It's like 15 seconds of judgment. Boom, just like that. And I go, ah, what happened in my brain? Or how about... People who butt in line somewhere, there's sort of a gap and you start to move up and they just come right in and smile. And you think, you know what? I bet they've done this their whole life. I bet their kids are gonna be butters. <laughs> and I'm going through this whole description of how they are just on a snap thing. Just the other day, I was doing the ride along with Monterey police. I like riding with them. And I'm with someone on the CAT team, CAT, Community Action Team, and their only job they respond to emergencies too, but their job is to find homeless people, people who look like they're really hurting and, and, and meet them, get to know them and say, how can we help? How can we help? We transported somebody to the uh, welfare building in Seaside. They want to help. So we're riding along afterwards and I saw how this officer had so many relationships with people and I said, you know, the sad thing is I, I'm guilty of it. People take one look at somebody and they go, I know all about them. I know why they got that way. I know they're this. I know they're that. And this officer, she was thoughtful for a moment. She goes, they do it with us too, police. Somebody can do something in Tennessee and we catch it here in Monterey. They don't even know us. And it happens all the time. A wise pastor put it this way. When we look at the word judgment, we have to be careful how we use it. How we use it is determined by context. He says this, the problem relates to how we understand the word judge. It can mean to distinguish, determine, make a legal judgment, punish or condemn. Context determines it. Context does, how we understand the word. We already know that judgment can mean that we can distinguish between right and wrong. We can determine if something is true or not. So that kind of judgment is okay. But that's not what we're looking at in this story, is it? That's not what we're looking at. In this sense, this is the negative sense of a critical spirit and a condemning heart. And it's often done, like I just related, quickly and harshly. 
It's rooted in pride and it aims to exclude, to move someone out of a relational setting or someone out of favor. That's what it's designed to do. And in a word, this type of judgment is hypocritical. It's hypocritical and, and, and Jesus condemns hypocritical judgment. That's what we're looking at here. So true confession, I, I mean, it's, I have a prayer I don't say every day, but I ought to, but I do say it regularly, really. Uh, usually early in the morning, I'll say, Lord, today, please, please, help me not be judgmental, petty, and critical, because I can slide into that place in a heartbeat. I wished it wasn't true. I begged to have it taken away, and yet it still happens. It still happens. And I just said, Lord, get in here. Get this out of me. So I don't know where you stand on this. But, but I'm going to walk you through 10 types of judgment. And these will be on the website in the sermon notes for tonight. Also on your app, if you have the Shoreline app. But when I walk you through these, here's the, the deal. Listen to them for you. Avoid that, you know, <laughs> temptation. That's natural too. Curb it. Look for yourself about you. Number one, type of judgment. I disguise my critical comments as truth. I'm not being critical. I'm just speaking truth. You have crow's feet. You've aged a lot in the last year. You don't dress well. I'm just telling the truth. Gosh. How about this? From other people's actions, I decide who they are as people. I used a couple of, of examples already. Somebody goes through the stop sign when I was clearly before them. I know all about them. I know all about them. They're the kind of person who. They could, could have received an emergency call. They could be going to pick up their kid from school who fell. I don't know anything, but it doesn't matter. I'll judge them right now. Number three, I expect perfection from others. I do. Do it right. Do it as it should be done. Would you just please get it right? By the way, you need to be extraordinarily forgiving and patient with me. Number four, your judgment of others paints a better picture of you. You know, I know what they did. I've never really done that. I've done these things, but I've never done that. Automatically meaning they're here and I'm here. You get a better picture of you when you use that kind of judgment. How about jumping to conclusions? How about criticizing yourself? Criticizing judging unto condemnation of yourself. Black and white thinking. Most of life is lived in grays in between black and white. Yet, sometimes we can say, no, it's either this or it's that. Nothing else, don't tell me. How about you see one trait and you assess the entire person? I was at a gathering last year, met somebody for the first time. I was looking forward to meeting. They began talking. 22 minutes later, they were still talking without punctuation. <laughs> that meant something at the time. I thought, wow, there's no break point. And here I am in my mind going, and I bet they drive everybody nuts where they work. I bet. I bet their mom was, had such a hard time being her. And I thought, Dennis, shut up. How'd you get there? How about this one? You work to fix, or here comes the quote marks, improve others. Why don't you dress different and do that a little different? I'm just trying to be helpful. I'm just trying to improve you, fix you. They never asked. And this consistently point out and comment on differences in others. This kind of judgment. The judgment of myself and the judgment I do with others takes God's grace and pushes it aside. It doesn't leave room for it. We need to know that. Pushes it aside. So what does God's word have to say about this? And we find it in James. James, remember, is the leader of the first church in Jerusalem, so he's establishing ground rules for behavior. And he says this in James 5, 9. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Don't do it. Jesus comments in Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge. Or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. How do you like it if people judge you the way you've been judging others? That's what he's telling us. So, so 
Plain and simple, this is hard. Stay with me. I deserve judgment for my sin, period. I do. Where does God's grace fit in this picture? Where does grace fit? And Paul captures it in Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Still, and the use of the word still means the continuance of an action or a condition. It's not here and then not and then here. It's the continuance of it. That's our nature. It seems too much for some people to consider this. I, you know, Dennis, I'm not really a sinner. I mean, sinner is like, ah, I make a mistake now and then. But I wouldn't classify myself as a sinner. It feels like too much of a label. But philosophers throughout history have pointed out something unique that you probably already know. Humans have a really uh, a prominent, distinct capacity for self-deception. Scripture addresses that. We find two verses in 1 John chapter 1. Here's the first one. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Raise the bar with verse 10. If, remember, a claim is an assertion. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. It's not possible to be without sin. And so eternal life isn't fair and square. You can't earn it. It's just not. It's a gift. And if it was a payment for work done in this world, good works done in this world, you know, day in, day out, good words, good works, guess what? You wouldn't get there, neither would I. It'll never be enough. That's what the Lord tells us. Eternal life cannot, by its nature, be earned. It must be a gift of grace. And that counterdicts how we get everything else in this world that we generally earn. That's why the heart must be submitted. This is a powerful grace. We get into God's kingdom by his generosity, not by my work and my goodness. His generosity is what we're learning and reading here. Paul reiterates this or covers this in Ephesians 2. And this is a great couple of verses. If you haven't memorized it, can I encourage you to memorize it? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So sometimes you hear that and you think, well, that's a setup. Why bother? Why bother? Because again, it's a condition of the heart, isn't it? He knows where your heart is. You can hide anything you want. You can't hide your heart. You can't hide that, that part of you that feels and thinks and understands and moves and is motivated, you can't hide it. So it's not possible to fool him. So what he wants from us is not to go forward and work to serve the kingdom because I want to earn points to try to get into heaven. He says, no, I want you to go forward because you understand the power of grace. You are still sinning, and yet I love you, and you can be with me. Just receive it. That's a challenge, but that's how much he loves us. If we had to earn it, none of us would get there. We can't be good enough and do enough to get there. So we humble ourselves. We fall to our knees. Say, Lord, I've tried. I'm exhausted from time trying to earn your love and earn your favor. Maybe growing up, I could never earn mom or dad. Who knows? And now I learn I can't earn yours either. What am I to do? And he goes, good, now you're where I need you to be. Do you understand? Now just open your heart and give it up. I'll come in. I'll come in. And it will, will all be made right with me. So if you're a believer and you have allowed this gift given in love to penetrate your heart and lead you in life. Oh, the gratitude. Oh, the gratitude. 
It's unspeakably beautiful. And the thanks we offer our Father. Lord, I get it. That's how much you love me. Oh, my word. His gift changes everything. Jesus paid the price for our sin. Our landowner has given us the denarius out of the grace of his heart. It's his generosity that redeems us. Not anything we can do except submit. Please pray with me. Lord God, thank you for this gift. Oh, my word. (laughs) Most beautiful thing imaginable. We could have never conceived of it. It's so different from everything else in our lives works, but here you are. Thank you. Praise you. Moving us tonight. If we're judgmental, sweep it aside. Let the grace pour in. We love you. But you love us more and you love us first. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I encourage you to keep yourselves in a place of that prayer as uh, quiet your heart as we read from God's word. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you're here on campus, you should have received a small bread and juice. Uh, We encourage you now to open them up. We always say start with the bread side if you have one that's got two sides. As if you start with the juice side, you're going to have a mess. Um, So anyway, if you have one of the others, the bread is right on top. And if you're at home, we encourage you to grab your elements there. Communion is is something that we do as Christians, as, as followers of Jesus. And if you're here this evening and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, meaning you haven't come to the cross, you haven't asked Jesus for eternal life, for that gift to accept it, then we just, and we invite you to watch, to, to witness the experience and, and to see why this is so important to us. And as we get ready to partake together, I just want to encourage you just to remember Jesus. Remember Jesus and the power of his life that he came to this earth and how he loved people so well. He loved us so much that he went to the cross to die for us. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again on the third day. And he's still living and active in our lives today. And this is also a time where we just get to come and we get to search our hearts. Communion isn't something that we just rush into. But as you hold the elements in your hands, I just want to encourage you. Just take moments to search your heart. Confess sin. Have a great, honest conversation with the Lord. And lastly, we just get to celebrate community. The moment you ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you were adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. And this moment for us as we come together as a family to reflect on what Jesus did on that cross, his body that was broken and his blood that was poured out for us is a very special thing. And for us to come as a family right here in this moment to reflect on that and to remember that. bread which we take represents Jesus' broken body. He said that night at the Last Supper, this is my body broken for you. Over the centuries and over cultures around this world, bread has has a big part. Bread is essential for sustenance. Bread is used in every area of this world. We know what this means, that this gives us life. Jesus himself was the bread 
of life. As we take this bread, representing his body, I want to encourage you to, to remember his sacrifice, to remember the gift that he gave us, and to remember his love. This is Jesus' body broken for us. Let us partake of it together. And the cup that we partake in, it represents the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And as we drink this, I just want to encourage you just to take some moments and just to reflect on the cross, reflect on Jesus as he hung there and died for you the nails that were driven through his hands, through his feet, and his blood that was poured out for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. And so that we could be set free and that we can have new life, new life in Christ. Drink this in remembrance of him. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, who lived among us. God, who one day would go to the cross, willingly go to the cross to die for us, to be the atonement for our sin. It's a debt we could never repay. And Jesus, as, as we come together as a family right now and take communion, we remember you. We remember your broken body. We remember your blood that was poured out for us on that cross, God, for the forgiveness of our sin. And God, through your blood, through your sacrifice, we are set free, we're made whole, we're made new. Thank you for that. We love you. It's in your name we pray, amen.